Some people would do just about anything for their family, but how far would you go? This is a question explored in 2004's Dead Man's Shoes, which has recently resurfaced in popularity. I'm going to discuss the nightmare fuel elements within, meaning there will be spoilers ahead and shocking themes. Before I crack on, please consider checking out our upcoming second channel, The Horror Exchange. But for now, let's talk about why Dead Man's Shoes is nightmare fuel. This film perfectly captures a rural location in the Midlands of England, which filmmaker Shane Meadows so often does. His work on the This Is England series gave a real authentic grittiness to what it's like living in the lower classes of England, not shying away from presenting the truth of real world issues. In Dead Man's Shoes, there's a shoe string from beginning to end, which makes every single scene and every Every single line feel genuine. The story in principle is extraordinarily simple, a cherry of an idea picked from a brutal tree of thorned branches. Richard is a British soldier, played tremendously by Paddy Considine. He returns from duty to his hometown of Matlock in Derbyshire, with one particular goal in mind, find and kill the men responsible for bullying his brother, Anthony. Anthony is mentally disabled, and as we learn via black and white flashbacks throughout the film, he is taken advantage of by the brash members of the town's drug network. He is verbally abused, physically assaulted and sexually exposed, all to the amusement of the gang members. Richard is well aware of this, as well as who exactly is responsible, and so he takes a vindictive vow of vengeance. What I find so unnerving about Considine's performance is how understated it is. He's extremely calm under pressure, carrying himself without fear or concern. In his mind, nothing can stop him, and so when he tracks down the culprits of Anthony's torment, it's game on. Quietly sitting in the corner of a pub, Richard is approached and intimidated by Herbie, one of the dealers. The switch from placid to dangerous is instantaneous. Richard doesn't falter or hesitate. He firmly puts his foot down here, establishing his limitless nature. It spooks Herbie, who exits the premises. Yet soon after, Richard catches up with him and apologises in a gentlemanly fashion. Yet despite Richard's kind selection of words and inviting approach, this somehow still winds up as intimidating Herbie, making him flee. Richard has already proven his capability to snap, so to see him return to a welcoming calmness conveys a sense of untrustworthiness. This causes Herbie's abandonment of the situation, and to inform other members of the gang that he believes the man to be Anthony's brother. The very idea of this is enough to inspire a stunned silence. Like they're well aware of what they've done, and they may very well have a hurricane coming their way. Even though Richard is that hurricane, it's easy for him to come across as a light breeze. You can never tell what he's feeling deep down, because he's an elite at locking away his true emotions. There is a volcano bubbling inside of him at all times, but he's able to make himself look friendly. A controlled rage. It's almost like a superpower which he carries on to exploit in the film. This kind of unfaltering firmness masking his power. But then when Richard adopts a different approach via literally masking himself, we are given an insight into a frightening world. Richard wears a gas mask, which any Doctor Who fan like myself already has PTSD over, and then he tracks down and scares Herbie. He continues to go after members of the gang wearing the mask, almost like it's his slasher villain disguise. You kind of root for Richard because of the bad guys being bullies, but equally you can visualise this as a ruthless unhinged murderer on the loose. And his first proper warning to the gang is one that is truly sinister. He spray paints the term Shane stalking on the wall of their flat. This refers to the pattern of breathing in dying people close to their demise. This message is a foreshadowing. Your time is running out. Get ready for me. 
Richard isn't just a cold-blooded killer though, he's actually able to show a sense of humour through pranking the gang members. He breaks into their homes with ease, colouring them up like clowns. He could end things there and then, but instead he delights in making the members target each other for who is responsible. Even in his state of mind, Richard can tone everything down and make it fun. And to me, that is terrifying. He's so psychologically threatening that he can literally mock the culprits. He is so powerful, he has that choice. It not only prolongs the fates of the men, it messes with their psyches alongside. It's almost like he's mimicking the pranks the men played on Anthony, something which could be seen as a bit of harmless fun. But from the perspective of the target, it's anything but. It's an embarrassment, one that the men aren't best pleased about. It's as if that is what Richard wants them to feel. He wants them to feel the emotion response Anthony felt before he makes the sky collapse down on them. In the film's most iconic scene, the gang's leader, Sonny, spots Richard in the street and approaches him. He tries to act like a hard man, dishing out his own intimidation tactics. In response, Richard cuts straight to the bone, just like he did in the pub with Herbie. He flat out says, yep, the pranks were him, and that he's not scared of any of them, and then openly reveals where he is staying and invites them to pay him a visit. Richard puts down a full house here. I can get under your skin without even trying, and I'm that confident in my own abilities. You can come to my doorstep at any time, and I'll be ready for you. Richard is a giant in comparison to the tiny insignificance of the gang, highlighted in his most famous line, you're fucking there mate, mimicking the clutch of the palm of his hand. Richard is an observer, a possessor, who can crush them with dominant ease. With the familiarities made and some cats set loose amongst the pigeons, it's only a matter of time before carnage is unleashed. The first victim is used by Richard to paint another threatening message. One down. The clock has started ticking towards doomsday. The gang head off to the farm where Richard is staying with Anthony, armed with bribery money and a rifle. Richard has no need for money, and in the altercation, another member is accidentally shot in the head by Sonny. Richard doesn't even have to properly get stuck in here. He can make the gang pick themselves off simply through their nerves getting jangled. He's so imposing, even from a distance, that death can swirl around his proximity with little effort. However, when it comes to Richard making an effort, it's genuinely terrifying what he can make happen. Once again, breaking into a house faultlessly, he spikes the kettle water with a supply of drugs he acquired earlier in the film. When the men make themselves a cuppa to take the edge off, it does anything but. It zombifies them, making them vulnerable and susceptible to Richard's will. He's turned the arsenal of the drug dealers against them, weaponizing their assets, and now he is in the driver's seat. What results is a varied series of vicious kills. Sonny, the gang leader, has a carrier bag wrapped around his head before a bullet is fired into it. A simple yet effective kill. Soz, another member, is picked off with a palm strike even with his bare hands, Richard can kill with a single blow. That palm of his hand where he kept Sonny earlier in the film is the same palm used to end a life. It's staggering. The last member in the house is Herbie, who is presented with a suitcase stuffed with the corpse of Tuff, one of the members who earlier ran away for safety, yet Richard tracked him down and picked him off. Herbie is taken out with that same misdirection of friendliness Richard used earlier in the film. He knows that Herbie is being truthful about what he says because he knows that if Herbie is lying, he will pursue him and kill him. Richard has established in Herbie's mind the consequences of lying can be fatal. So when asked if a nearby knife is to kill Richard and he says no, then Richard sticks by his rule and stabs Herbie to death. What I find so nightmarish about this sequence is how simply Richard is able to take the reins of the scenario. All it took was lacing some water with drugs and the rest was easy, too easy, like child's play. This is a detriment to Richard, something he acknowledges is a problem and is discussed in the film's climax. Mark is the final member of the gang responsible for Anthony's mishandling, and after he gathers word Richard has returned, he reveals 
reveals all to his wife. Anthony was abused to the point where he was given acid, had a noose wrapped around his neck, and the gang pretended to hang him. Then, after being abandoned and threatened not to leave the small room of the castle ruins Anthony is placed in, he hangs himself for real. The entire film, even though Richard has been accompanied by Anthony, he's never been alive. It's a vision of Anthony in Richard's mind, being by his side while he has been exacting his revenge. This is why Richard has turned to shedding blood. The bullying got to the extent where drug-induced suicide occurred, so it's only right that those guilty should die too. An innocent, mentally challenged boy was provoked to the point he took his own life. All because it was a laugh. There's no telling what bullying can lead to. How many invisible scars can be inflicted. And visible ones irreparable ones. In the film's final tragic sequence, Richard takes Mark hostage, leading him to the room Anthony died in. He asks Mark about the incident, what he did or what he didn't do. If Mark had stopped it, it would have stopped a lot of carnage, Richard says. This is such a chilling line, how one intervention of friendliness and sense could have changed everything. Richard also admits here to still hearing Anthony screaming his name. You can tell that he is mentally tortured on a daily basis by what has happened, and he wants it to stop. He begs Mark to stab him, to put an end to everything, because now he's the monster, and he doesn't know what else he is capable of. Everything Richard has done in the film up until now has been immeasurable. He can't tell exactly how further he can push his gauge, how much more of a beast he can become. Richard is the one who has worn the dead man's shoes. He was proverbially dead for the whole film. He knew that he wanted to get revenge and then die when the job was done. He had nothing he wanted to live for. He died with Anthony. All that's left that he needs to acquire is taking the lives of those who broke his. This is why he's felt no fear. He had nothing to lose. What we've seen is a man fueled by the nightmares of his loss with a single clear focus extermination. Mark stabs Richard, allowing him to find peace in death at last, and now there is blood on Mark's hands. Dead Man's Shoes has been a cult classic of the 21st century to lovers of British film, and it's incredible to see it getting deserved notoriety nearly two decades later. There's no bells and whistles to this one, it's a bona fide sticks and stones thriller that still feels as ultra realistic as the day it was released. Considine is electric, and the rest of the cast is very strong too, but the nightmare fuel core here is how much blood one can spill when some of their blood has prematurely dried. The manic vengeance of Dead Man's Shoes rightly earns its place on our Nightmare Fuel Hall of Fame. Do you agree with its placement? Let me know in the comments below. I'm Connor from Unleash the Ghouls, and I'll see you next time, waiting with a boiling kettle of Nightmare Fuel. Yeah.